Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us here. My name is Justin Raimondi, and I will be presenting alongside with Kyle Hedrick. And we would just like to thank you for your time, your attention, and like to thank everyone at Energis for organizing this despite all of the challenge they had to overcome to get here. So what we'll be talking about today is how a unique geoprocessing workflow can help you conduct risk screenings for HVAC corrosion. And so the agenda is we're going to begin by just introducing this topic, what that means, why is HVAC corrosion a concern, and specifically a concern to pipelines, oil and gas pipelines. And then I'll introduce some terms. And from there, I will kick it off to Kyle, who's going to be giving a live demonstration to really go through the workflow that we developed for this. And then we'll conclude with just some extensions of this work. So to begin, um, there's a vast pipeline network that runs through the United States as well as the, the world at this point. And this is also runs near um, transmission power lines as well. And so what this means is that when those two things interact, the magnetic field from the transmission power lines can actually interfere with the pipelines under the ground. And when that magnetic field from the power line comes in contact with the pipeline, it can introduce some stray current onto the pipeline. And what that can do is create a source of um, very aggressive corrosion. And this can, if not managed properly, lead to failures in pipelines. And so our goal is to prevent that. And I, we, what we did was develop a screening method to identify locations where there could be potential sources for this stray current and uh, potential sources where this corrosion could be occurring. And now this process was developed based on some industry research conducted by INGA, I-N-G-A-A, -A, which is the Interstate Natural Gas Association of America. And so just to give an example of how severe this corrosion can be, the accelerated corrosion from stray current interference um, can be shown on the, the rightmost, and I hope you can see my pointer here, the rightmost column of this table, and that's compared to just some general corrosion. So accelerated corrosion can get through 80 mils per year of um, a pipe wall, and, and that's been shown to occur corrosion that, that fast and aggressive compared to even an aggressive general corrosion would be 20 mils per year. So if you imagine a, an inspection on a pipeline and um, April of 2020, maybe this pipeline was 0.375 inches. Now assume at that time, both general corrosion and accelerated corrosion happened. And we're gonna compare these two scenarios. So on the left, you can see that after five years, which is a typical inspection interval, there's still 0.275 inches of pipe wall left from general, if there were just general corrosion, even at an aggressive 20 mils per year. Yes, 0.275 is quite a bit of wall loss, but that still is thick enough for the pipeline operator to identify the corrosion and have enough time to remediate it and do a repair as needed. Even after six years, there's still a fair amount of wall left. Oh. However, on the right side, as you can see from just accelerated corrosion, by the five year mark, there's actually zero pipe wall left. So this pipe would have failed under these conditions within the five years. So if the, the pipe was not inspected, the accelerated corrosion was not identified, this would have led to a failure in this instance. And that would have been well before the five year mark. So it's very important to conduct inspections and to do screenings to make sure that this corrosion is not present. And so here's an example of what the data source looks like. What we use is, of course, spatial data. And this was done using um, Esri's ArcGIS, ArcMap. And what we did was we compared a complex network of pipelines to um, transmission power lines. And that's uh, just an example of this complex network can be seen in the image below. Pipelines are in black, power lines are in blue. These colors will be consistent throughout the presentation, throughout Kyle's um, live demo. 
And as you can see, there's a complex network. There's a lot of pipelines and power lines um, interacting with each other in various ways. This is a very large data set. So that means our method for conducting the screening needs to be efficient, fairly automated, and it needs to also gather all the relevant data to understand all the various interactions between the pipelines and the power lines. And so before Kyle shows you how we solved this problem and how we gathered all the relevant data, I'm going to talk about some key ideas, key terms, key concepts, so what he's saying makes more sense. Okay, so first we're going to start with the idea of bearings. And that's what you see in the first diagram over there on the left. The, what we see is we have a, a pipeline at 136 degrees and a power line at 90 degrees. And their, their bearing is that degrees. So you can imagine it being the hand on a clock or just going around a dial of um, 360 degrees. And so the pipeline is at 136 degrees there, um, just following that hand all the way to the end. You can see it hits at 136. And then that means that the angle between the two is of course 46 degrees. You simply just subtract them once you have the bearings. And this is important because the shorter, the more acute the angle between the pipeline and the power line, the higher threat there is for um, this straight current interference. And now in the middle, you can see what we call buffers. So what we've done is we put a buffer in these diagrams. So we're at the uh, diagram at the top here. We put a buffer around this power line and that's a 500 foot buffer. And as you can see the pipeline, and this is a real pipeline, it actually, um, takes this path. Whenever it's within the buffer, it's of course within 500 feet of that power line. And now down here we have a, um, actually I think this is a thousand feet, I apologize. Yes, this yellow is an, a 1000 foot buffer. And then when it's within the green, this is actually a 2500 foot buffer. And so you can see whenever it's within the green buffer, the pipeline's within 2,500 feet of the um, power line. And so from buffers, we create rings. Now you can imagine a ring from here, this is the 1,000 to 2,500 foot ring. You can imagine this as just being the center buffer removed. So this ring is just from 1,000 to 2,500 feet, we remove the center. So whenever we're within the ring, the pipeline is 1,000 to 2,500 feet from the power line. And then we can see it moves in and out of the ring. And now down here, you can see all the rings that we created. And again, as it's moving into the different rings, you can see how close it is, um, the pipeline is to the power line. And this, these buckets and these distances have been created again, based off that INGA criteria as being, um, more and more relevant. And as the, the pipeline gets closer and closer to the power line, it becomes higher risk. And here you can see those, those buckets that we talked about, the 500 to 1,000 foot, 1,000 to 2,500 feet, um, et cetera. And so as we get closer and closer to the um, power line, as the pipeline gets closer, it gets into a realm of higher risk. And so being within 100 feet would be the highest risk, 100 to 500, 500 to 1,000, 1,000 to 2,500. Um, the, the risk decreases as it gets further away. And so now we wanna introduce, so that was separation distance, how far is the pipeline from the power line? Now we wanna introduce this idea of co-location length. The length is how long the pipeline is co-located with the power line. So ideally, ideally in a, in a low risk scenario, this pipeline would go into a buffer and then leave the buffer. It would not sit in a buffer for very long. However, you can see in this diagram, it's higher risk because it goes and it actually crosses that power line and it is co-located for a fairly long distance. So the longer the pipeline is within this buffer, the longer it's co-located with the power line and then the higher risk. So if it stays within those buffers for more than 5,000 feet, then that's when you start to get into a higher risk scenario. And then finally is this crossing angle. So 
That goes back to our bearings. The more acute the crossing angle between the pipeline and the power line, the higher risk. Now there's a couple other terms that I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on because um, they're not really part of the geoprocessing that we'll be discussing today, but they are relevant to risk. Um, first is current. The higher the current going through the um, transmission power line, the higher the risk. And so we actually didn't have current in this data set. And what we used was the Department of Homeland Security's data set um, for the power lines. The current was not available. So what we did was use volt class as sort of a proxy to estimate current. And then there's soil resistivity as well, which is relevant. That comes from a completely different data set on soils, which is from what's called SERGO. And that's the Soil Survey Geographic Database. So that was something else we did, again, separate from um, this geoprocessing workflow. And so with that, I will go ahead and pass it over to Kyle. Thanks, Justin. Let me share my screen. So like Justin said, we were able to create this workflow to basically determine these areas that would be more high risk and then to allow people to take the appropriate risk response actions that would be needed to mitigate them. And from our results, we basically, we create two sets of results. We create a tabular data set, which is what you're seeing here in this access database. And we also create a spatial um, set of data that we're going to look at shortly. So here in our tabular uh, results, we can see we have measured events that show the angle difference between all our pipelines and all our power lines, for example. So we can see here we have some uh, a pipeline that interacts with three different power lines and you know, one of them only has a angle separation of, or an intersect angle of three, and it ranges all the way up to 90. So you can kind of see when you take these, these uh, results and you can put them into the bins and you can get your high risk, low risk, and medium risk. And then we also have our separation distance, which Justin mentioned just shows for how or gives a measure event of from you know zero feet to 218 feet we're within a 500 foot buffer of a power line um, and then obviously it would jump out to 218 to 418 feet it's within a 100 foot buffer and so on and so forth and then we have our co-location distances which is like justin mentioned how long is that pipeline going within a specific buffer of a power line. So we can get our to and from measures and then it within it's within a thousand foot buffer for 1300 feet. And then we are able to create that for all the pipelines that we're looking at um, to create these events. The last thing we wanted to look or that we were able to look at, and this is kind of above and beyond what the Inga document that we referenced did was we wanted, as we did this, we kind of realized, well, we want to get a count of how many power lines each section pipe is act actually interacting with. Um, so we're able to create that where we can see from, you know, zero feet to 218 feet, this pipeline is only interacting with one single power line. But as you go along, there are portions that are interacting with two different power lines, um, this, and then even down to three power lines. And it, it varies obviously in the area. And, you know, it's just another, another good piece of data to be able to implement into your risk model to be able to calculate the actual risk. So now I'm gonna show more of the geospatial side of, of the, um, process. And this is just a data a sample data set that we have. Um, our power lines are in blue and then our pipelines are in black, similar to the images Justin showed. And as you can imagine, 
you know, it can get pretty complex because you have power lines going across and lots of pipelines. There's a lot of different inter interactions that we want to account for. And the first one is our, our intersect angles, like we mentioned before. Now, intersect angles, they're fairly complex because if you were to just look at the pipeline, you can't just give one intersect value for the entire piece of pipe because it changes, obviously. Um, as your pipeline goes, it, it has changes in directions. Same with the power lines, you know, it goes, we can see here there's a 90 degree change and about a 45 ish over here. And we have to account for all that. So the way we did that is we took both the power lines and the pipelines and we split them, both of them at every single vertex along the line. And what that does is it creates um, lots of individual segments. And these individual segments only have one begin vertex and one end point vertex, and that's it. So there's nothing in between. So for that line, it does not change direction at all. So that way we're able to account for every single change along both the pipelines and the power lines, which is pretty important when you're trying to, you know, look at all the different interactions that can happen. So after we split all these up using some of Esri's tools, we then used Python to be able to calculate the actual bearing of all the segments for both the pipelines and the power lines. And we did that first, that way when we create our buffers and then our rings, that data um, stays with the, the records of those buffers that are created. So like Justin mentioned, we first created all of our buffers. So we have our 500 foot, uh, sorry, 100 foot, 500 foot, 1,000 feet and 2,500 foot buffers. And then we created the rings, like Justin mentioned. And to do those rings, we basically just took the, the next smallest buffer and erased it from the larger buffer. So for the, the 1,000 to 2,500 foot ring, you just took the 2,500 foot buffer and then just erased the 1,000 foot buffer. And then we did that for 500 feet to 1,000 feet, 100 feet to, to 500 feet, and then obviously 100 foot buffer is the smallest, so there's, there's nothing to erase. And the reason we did the rings is to eliminate overlap. Um, so that way for each power line, it's only within one section, because otherwise if we were to zoom in, say into here, if we didn't create rings and we just use buffers, we would have events or records for both a um, thousand foot buffer and a 2,500 foot buffer. So we use the rings to try and eliminate some of those overlaps. And once we have the, the rings um, that have the bearings of the power lines, we're able to use the um, Esri's Locate features along routes tool, which a lot of people call the LFART tool. That's what I'm going to refer to it as. Um, so we use this LFART tool to create linear records of where the pipeline interacts with these buffers, or sorry, with these rings. So that creates these linear events that show. If we look at the um, attribute table down here, we'll be able to, we get the measured event with a to and from um, stationing. And it shows that from, you know, 1400 feet to 2000 feet, it's within a, oh, sorry. It's within a um, 2500 foot or 1000 to 2500 foot ring. We have the transmission line bearing that we get of 88 degrees and then a pipeline bearing of 20 degrees. And then we get our intersect, intersect angle. And the, with this being a more automated process, we're able to do this 
over larger scales of data. Um, so entire systems, we can do this at a single time. So that's our intersect angles. Next, we'll look at our separation distances. And our separation distances, as we mentioned before, just shows where along or how far away is each section of pipe from our power lines. And to do that, we used the same style of rings um, that we used for the intersect angles. The, the main difference is we didn't have to split up the pipelines and the power lines because um, there wasn't, we don't have to worry about angles. So we can just run everything um, without splitting up any of the lines. So here, after we create our rings, so we can see um, we have our different rings, there's no overlaps. And we can take that LFAR tool once again to create our linear records. So after we create those records, we can see that we get measured, measured events that shows you know, from 1,400 feet to 1,600 feet, it's within a 2,500 foot ring. And from 1,600 to 1,700 feet, it's within 1,000 feet. And then 17,000 to 17,800, give or take, it's within a 500 foot ring. And then, um, so this line actually splits, so there's, a little bit of a gap in between the two. And we can see from here, we have the very beginning of the line is within that 500 foot ring. And then it goes within 100 feet and then back out to 500 feet. So we can get all those vents to show how close the pipeline is to all these different power lines. And so this actually, if you have multiple power lines within the area, you'll get overlapping, uh, basically duplicate records. And we take care of that when we worked on this in the risk model to handle that. Um, because as you can imagine, the more power lines you, you interact with, you're gonna have more and more records. So that's our separation distance. The next thing, we really looked at was our co-location, which is showing for how long is that pipeline within a specific buffer. And for this case, we didn't use the ring method like we did for co-location and intersect angles. We just used buffer. So we created our 2,500 foot buffer, 1,000 foot buffer, 500 feet, 100 feet, and then we left them as is, uh, did not erase the middle. We wanted to be able to see for how long is it within a 1,000 foot buffer, how long it's within a 500 foot buffer, and so on and so forth. And if we erase those middle portions, um, just we wouldn't be able to see truly how long it's going within a, inside that 2,500 foot buffer, we would only get a record from here to here. So that's why we left them without creating the rings. And again, we use the um, LFART tool to be able to calculate the measured events. So here we can see if we were to select all these guys, you can see, as you imagine, we get three records. One shows that for 3,200 feet, we're within that 2,500 foot buffer. Um, for 1,200 feet, we're within a 1,000 foot buffer. And 540 feet, we're within that 500 foot buffer. And then if I went in, there would be a record for that 100 foot if I zoomed in and selected. Now, now we would have um, our co-location 
measured events are events for separation distance and angles. The last thing that we looked at was the power line count or determining how many power lines um, each pipeline is actually interacting with. And to do that, we took our, our buffers, or no, sorry, we used our rings for this. Um, we create a union on them to be able to see where there's overlap. So if you imagine over in this section, we have our power line coming across. There's only one right here. There's only one ring that the that's here. There's only there's only one power line that's creating a ring. So you only have one one record. But if we go into areas that are more complex, say right here, all of a sudden we have two because there's we got two power lines. So and if we were to zoom into some of these more complex areas, we get all the way up to four power lines. Um, so that would be an area of concern. So once we have these overlaps, we're able to create a count that just shows, gives us a, just a, a field that shows how many uh, polygons were in that previous step and gives us a good value so that way we can use the LFART tool again to be able to determine um, measured events of where this pipeline is going in and out and inter interacting with those multiple multiple power lines. And that looks like this, so we can see that right there. We can see that from zero to a thousand feet, it's only interacting with one power line. And then from 1,000 feet to 1,500, it's interacting with two. So that would be an area of a little bit higher risk. And then it goes back down to one and so on and so forth. And we're able to take all this data. Um, Justin was able to formulate it into a model to be able to calculate the risk of these areas and then do some other really, really cool things. Now, those are kind of all the, the broad areas that we looked at. And one big thing with this process that we wanted to be able to do is create a method that's easily repeatable. Um, because when you're doing all this, this large scale work, you wanna be able to recreate it um, year after year and recreate it with new up-to-date data. Um, and to do that, we use both Python and then Esri's model builder to actually create a, a workflow to be able to process all this data. And what that does is it allows us a lot of flexibility. So we can take newer, uh, if we have new surveys and new center lines, we can easily implement that. Um, if there's new HVA or power line data set, like Justin said, we use Department of Homeland Security, which is a good data set, but it does have its limitations. And if a new data set comes along, we can easily interchange that into this to be able to create better and better results. So it just gives us a lot of, a lot of flexibility. And we can also take this if we want to know co-locations and separation distances of other linear features, such as rivers, um, roads, railroads, that kind of thing, we can adjust this fairly easily and get that data out. And it's just, it's a highly repetitive model. Um, it just gives us a lot of flexibility to be able to do a lot of different things. And with that, I will pass it back over to Justin for some final comments. All right. Thanks, Kyle. I'll just go ahead and wrap up here. So like Kyle said, um, at the end of this, we get a 
pretty large data set and that shows us all of the interactions and captures all of the relevant data between each pipeline and each power line. Here's an example of some of the generic co-location tables um, and they're, they're just the outline of all of those tables. And this is actually an example in the new pods that will be coming out, the new pods extension. For those of you who don't know, that's the um, pipeline open data standard. And this is just the layout of the different data that we're capturing. And this is called generic because again, like Kyle mentioned, this is not limited to pipelines and power lines. This can be any two linear data sets that you want to see interactions between. And so that can be used for pipelines and roads just to see how far a pipeline runs near a road, its angle of intersection, things like that. It can be used for not only linear features, but also pointer polygon features. So say something like a hospital or a park is represented by a point or a polygon. Um, we can then create buffers around those, create rings around the pointer, the polygon, and then see how the pipelines interact with those features and collect similar data. How far is the pipeline from the school? How long does it stay within this buffer or this ring, et cetera? So this workflow is readily extended to different applications, different data sets. Um, and is really developed to be flexible as we find new applications for it that we can apply it to. And so in conclusion, AC corrosion is significant threat to pipelines that we want to make sure that we identify and that we manage. So what we did was we took this challenging data set and we developed a solution that in the end you can have a tabular data set or a spatial data set that allows you to identify high risk areas, areas of concern, as well as low risk areas. That screening can then be used to inform surveys where pipeline operators can go out, survey the area to understand if there is a source of concern and deal with that um, in between inspection intervals or regularly as needed. And then this method is not limited to pipelines, to power lines, to any specific data set, but can be extended um, as needed. And so with that, I'd like to thank you again for your time and open it up to any questions.